Well, Daddy, what's your story? How come you're here and he's no help? Well, um, I'm just sort of here to report in to let us know what's been happening with me, but um, I think I might have found help elsewhere. Well, what are you talking about? Well, um, well, I've sort of been finding out a bit about God. Oh, great! That's all I need. I'm at the lowest point ever in my life. And some fanatic starts talking to me about God. Well, you may be ready to sell out, mate, but if you ask me, religion's full of food. What's going on out here? What are you trying to do to me? This idiot thinks he knows my problem better than me. I never said that. All I said was what I was doing to try and find the answer. Well, then what is the answer? answer indeed and who has that answer we'd like to share more about that with you in a little later hello my name is Tepa and I've got a number of announcements to make and then we're going to take up the offering the first announcement is that tonight there's going to be a combined service and that's going to be held outside the New World car park just down the road here at 8 o'clock starting at 8 o'clock so everybody here is invited to attend that the next announcement is that next Saturday, Saturday evening, that's uh, Christmas Eve, the night before, for, uh, before Christmas Day, there's going to be a service here at 11.30 at night. So those two services, the one tonight at 8pm outside New World Car Park, and next Saturday evening at 11.30 in here. So we extend a warm invitation, uh, welcome to each person here, and to your families, and to your friends and neighbours too, you're all welcome. We're now going to take up the offering, and the offering bags are going to move down the aisles and, and across each, each row. If you're a visitor here, uh, please just pass the bag on to the next person in the row beside you. Uh, as, as visitors here, you're our guests, and uh, it is our pleasure to host you. Before the offering is actually taken up, I'm just going to pray for the offering so that the offering can be taken up. Okay, let's, let's bow our heads and pray. Father, at this uh, time of year, we are reminded of the things that you've given to us, and especially the most precious gift of all, your Son. And as uh, we take up this offering, uh, we return a little of what you've given to us and ask that you would bless it and bless the hands that. Uh, Give it, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The offering bags are just coming down now. Thank you, Dave. Yeah. And just as that is happening, uh, uh, following this, the, Nick and the team are going to uh, lead another song, and that is Down in the Lowlands.
you get to um, stand and join in with us as we sing. Um, one of the things that we've found is um, for those of us who have been in despair and have found that there is a hope, is, um, is in our God, that he is an awesome God. So if you'd like to stand, and we're all going to sing this.
in the way that others do. I went to the place I was staying at, a very close friend's place, and, and I uh, started reading books, book after book after book. I'd never been a bookworm. I became a bookworm around that period of time, and I just kept reading books. And every book I read annoyed me. I picked up a Reader's Digest and somebody had this crazy story about some crazy situation. You know, the kind of thing where they've been bitten by a shark and they sort of poke the shark in the eye and somehow they get rescued because they cried out to God and he helped them. And so the last thing I wanted to hear, I'd become a Christian at that point, but I really wasn't feeling too happy with God letting my girlfriend do what she did. We were thinking of getting married. I was down in the supermarket a few months ago and I'm sure some of you have even had this happen to you. Maybe you were even the perpetrator of it, but it was this little wee child and it had obviously gotten lost and people were trying to pacify this child and uh, the more they tried, the more the child screamed its head off. You know, somebody tried to pick up, ah! you know, that kind of thing. People went near the child. You know, there was this absolute despair, there was this absolute feeling of hopelessness as the adults tried to pacify the child, couldn't find a parent. Have you ever been to the supermarket and taken your children and driven off home and left them there by accident? <laughs> you know? I know there's somebody here in the congregation has done that. Didn't realise you had them with you. You ever wonder what the child goes through when you're not there? It's so relieved to see you when you get there, but there's this kind of despair. It can leave you like that. I know when I was a young Christian, I had a friend who, who couldn't speak properly because they sit with a scalpel when they're trying to operate on, a, on his goiter. They managed to damage his vocal cords. And my friend Murray used to always tease us a little bit. And he used to say to us as Christians, he used to say, he said, um, you guys, we're going to pray me tonight if I don't turn up. Because he couldn't speak properly, see? <coughs> said, if I don't turn up, I can't do any more croaky, I'm going to have a little croaky. Mm. said, if I don't turn up, don't worry, just keep praying, the Lord's taking me home. You know, then he'd turn up late to the prayer meeting. You know, we'd all be looking at each other, you know, we're very young Christians, we're looking at each other like this, sideways. You know, maybe God's come back and left us behind. Okay? It's not a very comforting feeling. Then you get the situations in, uh, in marriage. Maybe in, not even a marriage sometimes, prior to marriage. But usually it only happens in marriage. People start out, they love each other, you know? And yet you get us all romantic, wishy-washy, gishy-gashy stuff, you know, so they go doozy all over each other, you know? I love you, darling. I love you eternally. And three days after they're married, they suddenly discover that maybe their love was a bit ill founded. Maybe things aren't as gooey and nice as they thought it should be. Suddenly they discover there's a past and a person they didn't know about. But the trouble is, the past still lives. The past and the person may not have appeared in their engagement. Pauline and I had a tremendously happy engagement. We never had any conflict during our engagement, but the first two years of our marriage was sheer hell. And uh, I got pretty discouraged about it. And, you know, I didn't think to ask God about it. I just sort of tried to truck on. And, well, I knew if I asked God, I was in trouble in any case half the time. You know what I'm saying, eh? I thought I loved you. Why is it I don't now? What is it that's behind this song? I'm so discouraged about my marriage. No, I'm not now. I'm, uh, I'm just reflecting the way I felt at the time. There's a story in the scriptures where Paul, he was one of the guys who went around killing Christians for some time and then got converted himself pretty dramatically, riding along the horse, and God comes on, knocks him off his horse and speaks to him. Later on, he's travelling on a ship. And as he's travelling on the ship, a storm hits him. And a storm drives him out to sea. And in those days, 
their navigation. They didn't have satellites to, to know where they were. And the scripture says the sun and the moon, uh, the, the sun and the stars, they couldn't see any anymore. And they, and they hadn't appeared for many days. The storm continued raging. And then and he says, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. And Luke writing this account. Now, I don't know how Paul felt, but eventually Paul was the one who says, come on, guys, don't give up. They spoke about the despair they were in. He says, don't give up. Don't give up. It's no worth giving up. He says, uh, you know, you've got, to, you've got to trust God. I'm sure some of those hardened seamen probably felt like guns at them. You know? People like to be self-dependent, but when you're in trouble in the midst of a storm, it's not so easy, is it? So what is despair? I looked up the dictionaries, and this is a definition, I think, that brings them all together. To lose confidence. To exist in hopelessness, a state of hopelessness. A lack of hope or expectation. You know, when you're facing the tough times, you can lose hope. You can say, well, when you're facing marriage conflict, I can't get out of this. There's no way. We can't solve this. And we can give up at that point when we really didn't need to. And it shows out in all sorts of ways and and the things that we do. You know, doctors often can't cure people because the stomachache they're complaining about wasn't caused by a germ that's existing in their system. He can give them tablets that will maybe calm them down a little bit, but he actually won't solve the problem. Because the cause of the thing is the thing that needs to be solved. Isn't that true? And if you don't solve the cause, then you haven't solved the problem. And eventually, the guy's going to, the answers in the stomach's going to increase even further. And the doctor's going to have to increase the number of uh, tablets that he gives him, the higher antacid levels, and eventually the body adapts to that. And, and so in the end, the guy ends up with massive stomach ulcers because the problem still exists. The doctor was only treating the symptom. What about headaches? same thing, exactly the same thing. Those kinds of difficulties that people find when headaches continually pound in their head and, and I know what that feels like after having shingles. I've had most of the last five years with severe pain at times and it can get you down. I was the optimist as I said earlier but when I got shingles I, I discovered what it was like. I'd always been compassionate towards people who, who didn't um, didn't feel like coping at times. But I felt what it was like to feel the absolute despair that the one moment a person could say to you really nice things and the next minute they could say to you something else that was quite nice and for some unknown reason that would affect me negatively and I never thought that could happen. And I was a Christian. The outcome that often happens to people and and I guess that's one of the reasons it hasn't happened to me is because of my relationship with God. But the kinds of act outcomes that usually happen is it causes us to become dysfunctional. You know, people get angry quickly. They live in violence. Or they, they do things because people have hurt them. They do things that they never wanted to do, really. They look for love and interpret it as sex when it's not love at all. They look for, for help in all sorts of ways. They've developed bad attitudes. They become selfish people. You see it in little children. Children that are selfish. I always remember when my daughters were younger, they, uh, they picked up some other children and the way that they changed the lives of those children was that they kept giving to children that kept possessing. And, uh, and I never told them to do this. This just happened. Uh, we were fortunate. We were blessed with our children. And, um, and what happened, they, they, just kept, they just kept giving. And the other children eventually learnt that giving was good fun. And you didn't have to be selfish. You didn't have to live in the selfish mode of me, 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 which always drives people to despair. The other 
types of things that happen and things that are sometimes not so easily recognised is when people feel overdriven. You know, they've always got to do, they always got to choose, they always got to have. Uh, and, and people sometimes see it as a good thing. You know, they belong to every club in existence and they, they've got to help people, they've got to do this, they've got to do this. You know, really, often, although those things might be good things, often people are doing it for the wrong reasons. They're doing it to try and fulfil their own ambitions and desires, to try and satisfy a deep hole and need in their own lives. And so they devour character flaws. They become controlling people. They become people with bad attitudes. Or they become people who lack any kind of control whatsoever. And they live in total despair and despondency. It's a very per pervasive thing, is despair. It creeps in on us all over the place. And even little things can trigger it. I wonder, and I want to ask you a question this morning. What is the thing that has triggered any kind of despair off in your life? What is it? And why does God allow despair to exist in our lives? Well, why does he allow this to happen to us? I want to read a small verse, a couple of verses to you that, that, that comes from the scripture. And it comes from uh, 2 Corinthians. For those of you who know where that is, it's a, it's a letter that was written to a people called the Corinthian people. And this is what it says. We do not want you to be uninformed about the hardships we suffer in the pro suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. This is Paul talking again. Indeed, in our hearts we felt the sentence of death. But this happened, that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. I wonder if you have found that to be your experience. There's a, there's a film that was around recently, and I can't think of the name of it. You might, you might know the film I'm talking about. The robot who, who turned up, he'd escaped from the NASA. You know the film I'm talking about? Five. Number five is a low, that's the one. I didn't see the whole thing, but I saw parts of it at different times. Intriguing story, really. Because it was a robot that was out of their control. And uh, he kept getting into trouble, didn't he? And kept getting gooey eyes for a female human. I mean, what an incompatibility that would be in bed. He was right out of control. And the guys were trying to bring him back into control again, but he felt that everything was all right. And she became convinced of the same thing, that he ought to be rescued, he ought to be helped and defeat these other guys. She couldn't see the possible dangers of a robot like that getting on the loose. They could, of course. And I think they were a little bit uh, wrong, too. I don't want to draw the parallels too strong here. But I think that sometimes we're a little bit like that robot. We can become convinced of our own independence, our own indestructibility, and our own ability. And what God wants to say to us very clearly is that we need to stop relying on ourselves like that. We need to come to a place that will break us out of the things that are going to only lead to eventually further despair. And ultimately, I believe that what happens to many people when they get older, the kinds of things, sad situations you see in, in homes with elderly folk is where the despair becomes so deep so hard to deal with that they become suicidal. They want to take options to step away from life like what's been happening in the States. Those big court cases where people have assisted suicide. That's not what God wants. It's only a, a temporary relief for any of us to be able to go into that. 
No, the alcoholic looks for booze. The alternative lifestyler looks for drug and drugs and meditation. The workaholic, he looks to, to being occupied. Re the recreationalist, the recreationist, looks to fitness and health. The hypochondriac looks to the doctor. The family man gets preoccupied with those that are around him. But at the end of the whole thing, what does it all mean? And what uh, Florence read out earlier, it's all meaningless when you get down to the bottom of it. It really is quite meaningless. And what God wants us to understand in our lives is that he does want us not to rely just on ourselves, but he wants us to be in relationship with him. He wants us to be dependent on him. He wants to be able to give to us because he's a father who does love. And in our community, in our society today, we don't understand that very easily. And I can say that with some sure truth in my own heart. I did not understand what a true father was until I really got to know God. I had real reasons for not understanding that. Some people say, well, I've tried religion. I distrust God. Or I live a good life. I believe in the man upstairs and I believe he's very generous and he won't do any bad to me. <laughs> that, that, that's true, he won't do any bad to us. But ultimately, we are the ones who make the decision about the judgment we face. In Ecclesiastes 2.26, I want to read that passage that uh, Florence read, just the last couple of verses. It says this, to the man who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to, to the one who pleases God. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I want to challenge you today, the songs that have been sung, and the drums that are portrayed here this morning. Are you a person who really surely knows, for sure, true satisfaction and hope, harmony in your life with your husband or wife or in your family or in the things that you do? Do you know for sure that you have pleased God? And if you don't, then I want to recommend them highly. He won't take away your pain instantly, as some people have wrongly said he will do. He hasn't promised us that we won't go through tough times, but what he has promised us, he's promised us that he'll be there with us. He'll give us hope because of what he's promised us for the future and for the now. But he is willing to change our circumstances if we will participate with him, and that may mean character changes and nature changes in our own lives, but it definitely means that we need to come to a place where we recognise our own inability and the fact that our own despair is created by the situations around us and the fact that we are not reliant on them. Even for those that claim to be Christians, sometimes we can live independent of God. That's what Paul was saying. And he doesn't want us to be like that. He wants us to be free. And I challenge you this morning. If you don't know the living God, or if you do know him, and you, you've placed despair in life, he offers the freedom. He offers the joy and the hope that can overcome the despair. But it's only in true relationship with him that we can know that. And I recommend, if you've come with a friend today, or, or if you haven't, that you find somebody that you do know, I recommend that you go to them and say, hey, I'm interested in knowing the Lord. I'm interested in knowing your God in that way. And I'd like to walk with him. If you want to do that, then you, then you talk with your friend or, or come and talk with one of us and be here this morning. Because we would love you to know the same hope that we know. Let's pray together. And if you'd like to join us, I'd invite you to join us in this prayer. Father God, we get ourselves in situations we really don't want to get ourselves into. Sometimes our marriage difficulties, sometimes the situations because we're attracted to 
other answers other than you. And it seems really crazy sometimes, all, but sometimes we chase things that are so stupid. And we don't even see it. Lord, I pray that you'd help each one of us here to recognize the things that you want to change and be able to take those things up and to walk in relationship with you in our lives. And Lord, we, we want to say, Lord, we're sorry for where we've gone, where we've, where we've been relying on ourselves and not relying on you. And we want to come here this morning. Help us, O oh God. In Jesus' name. And they all see? Amen. I really pray that the Lord will be with you. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask us. Lord bless you. We're going to now have a, a sort of a, a morning tea type arrangement thing out here with plenty of goodies. Now you're welcome to just come and eat. They'll all be already supplied. The Lord bless you. Have a neat day.